So, Marty Friedman, welcome to the I Heart Guitar Podcast. It's nice to be here. Nice to talk to you. Nice to have you. So, um, you are coming to Australia soon, and I'm really excited as a Melbourneian to see that you've had to add a second Melbourne date because the first one sold out so quick. Yeah, it's a, it's a great thing. Um, I have really no idea what to expect. Uh, it's my first solo tour of Australia with my band from Japan, and uh, really have no idea what was waiting, but uh, tickets moved so fast in Melbourne that we had to... Uh, put up another show and I hear that show's doing well, really well and uh, all the shows are doing really well except the Canberra show has got plenty of tickets available so if you're listening in Canberra um, please make it out but um, I'm very very happily surprised with how well all the other shows are doing so far yeah well what can we as an audience expect what kind of uh, you know what's the breadth of material you play as a solo act well, since it's my first time touring in Australia, I'm going to do things a little bit different than what I usually do in America and Europe and Asia, South America, everywhere else, um, where I go kind of regularly, regularly, like, uh, you know, a couple tours a year or once every year or something like that. Usually I focus a whole lot more on the whatever album out, whatever album is out that I'm touring for and feature a lot of new stuff. But since I've never been doing this in Australia, I'm going to reach back and just try to get a really well balanced of everything from my entire solo career, which is 14 albums. So the show's going to be long, first of all. <laughs> and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be really hard to uh, nail down, you know, what's going to be uh, the kind of best introductory introductory set for what what to expect for a Marty Friedman show, but uh, I think the closest thing would be maybe uh, energy-wise, if, you, if you've if you heard the new live album called One Bad MF Live, mm. um, that's going to pretty much set the overall violent, aggressive tone <laughs> balanced off with uh, extremely romantic ballads and nothing really in between. So uh, it's it's going to be, it's, it's really hard to explain. I get that question a lot, but uh, hopefully the main thing is people leave the show with an extremely positive, uh, um, very energized, adrenalized feeling, really like, wow, I'm really glad I did that, really glad I went to see those guys. And one thing is for sure, you know, maybe people are going to go to see me in the show, but they're going to walk away thinking about my band members because they're just going to blow your minds. They're going to outshine me every night and um, you're going to leave thinking about them. That That's for sure. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I remember when, um, when you, you know, went over to Japan and stuff and everyone was like, Oh, Marty's gone pop. And it's like, no, like I listened to the stuff you're doing and it's like, you found a way to use the positivity of, you know, that kind of music with the energy of metal and, it's fucking fun. <laughs> ah, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. So that's a pretty good way to sum it up. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Um, I saw you during an Australian clinic years ago, and you said something that really stood out to me. You, um, if I recall correctly, you didn't bring a guitar with you. You just told the store hosting the clinic to find like the two best sounding guitars that would stay in tune, and you right. weren't. Fun- that was, I thought that was awesome because like so many players get stuck into this thing of I need my exact gear or I can't play. And I think you set a really good example by just, you know, the most important thing is entertaining the crowd. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, uh, especially at those events, um, well, I don't know. I mean, everybody's different. I mean, uh, there's a lot of guys out there who are super, uh, knowledgeable about gear and what the what the possibilities you can get out of gear and how to make the best out of gear and those kind of guys are really um perfect for those type of clinics and when those questions come up they're really good for answering that and uh i'm just not that guy um Mm. and for better or for worse i mean it's not something that i'm particularly proud of being ignorant is not something to be particularly proud of Um, but, um, 
luckily, um, hopefully I can make up for that lack of knowledge with, uh, in, uh, enthusiasm for music in general, the music, the, uh, the content. And, uh, I was never really a gear person and, and what you said sounds exactly right. Usually I will just say, you know, get me something that works. And, um, luckily, um, my Jackson signature model works everywhere in every situation. And all I have to do is say, get one of those and mm. I'll just, just show up. So I don't really need anything special. I, I just, something that's right off rack will be just fine for me to get my music out of it. You know, of course there'll yeah. be guys who, who know gear much better and could probably expand on what I'm doing. And those are the guys who I hire in the studio to do just that and tweak things and and get that little extra sonic thing that you need when you're recording. But uh, it's definitely not something that you need when you're just trying to answer kids' questions and, and play some music. Yeah, I've always been um, I've always been of the opinion that you never want to walk into a situation where someone goes, "Dude, play something for me," and hands you a guitar, and you're like, "Oh, I can't." I can't play this one. <laughs> it's like, you just, you know, you just want to make them happy and play some music, you know? Certainly, certainly. So, um, I was really glad to see you come back to Jackson because to me, like, um, I mean, Rust in Peace came out when I was 12 years old and, <laughs> you know, for me that the whole, you know, the whole thing of you with a Jackson was like, that was an inspiration to me as a kid and oh, as a teenager and stuff. Um, so to see you come cool. back to the Jackson family was really cool, but you didn't just, decide, oh, let's just put out a, a Kelly model again. You've done something very unique. Right, right. Well, I, you know, obviously already did the Kelly, so there's really no reason to do it again. Um, and I still play those. I play them live all the time. Mm. And um, it's just another great guitar, and I was super, super proud to kind of uh, be the image of that shape and uh, very happy with that. But uh, that was a complete history ago so you got to keep uh evolving and i did with with other guitar makers as well in between mm. and uh try to do what i wanted to do at those times that was fitting what i was playing and it was all exactly what i wanted it to be and uh so a time came where it, jackson was the right place to go and they were unbelievably um, cooperative and innovative with the things that I wanted to do. And, and actually starting next year around March, they're going to be releasing something that I, I don't even want to tell you about it, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't, I don't even think I can, I don't even yeah. think I'm allowed to, but um, <laughs> they're going to announce something at the NAM coming up, um, having to do with my signature models. That's never been done in the history of a uh, guitar. And it's going to be something that hopefully, uh, a lot of uh, people are going to enjoy, and we'll just leave it at that. But I'm just okay. <laughs> completely stoked, stoked about Jackson, and, and Jackson has uh, always been a, a Class A, you know, top shelf company, and they're really growing more and more. And I'm glad to be on the team. Yeah, this is going to sound really kick uh, kiss ass, but anything I've had to do with Fender and their family of brands, like those guys are so friendly and welcoming and you know as a journalist they're always great about giving me you know access to information i need and you know i get great. to go to the nan parties and meet eddie van halen and <laughs> you know hey that's that's worth it right there that that's a that's a plus right there yeah totally <laughs> um so i wanted to ask you about your amg pickups because if you're a you know if you're not a super you know gear kind of oriented guy. I want to know what kind of language you use to describe what you're after when you're doing that. Cause I know for me, I have some custom pickups that Seymour Duncan makes for me. Cause I used to work for those guys as a social media guy. And, um, I've got this set of pickups where I said, I want a pickup that sounds like sunshine through a glass of beer <laughs> and tastes like creme brulee. <laughs> and they're like, okay, we know how to do that. Do you kind of talk uh -huh. in those abstract terms or how do you voice a pickup? Uh, not as, uh, exquisitely as what you just said, <laughs> but, uh, um, fortunately the people at EMG and I speak the exact same way to the Jackson folks and the angle people as well. Fortunately, they know, uh, my terminology and it's very 
straight ahead. Like it's usually something like this sounds cheap or this sounds cheesy or make it sound better. <laughs> you know, it's really, it's really not not anything that uh, anyone intelligent could have anything to go from. But I think the point is, um, I always wind up getting the sound that I want, so I can give. I can give them sonic examples of what I'm looking for. Like, for example, I might have a solo in one of my songs that I really like the tone of. Um, like on the Wall of Sound album, I think uh, my favorite tone is is the last guitar solo in uh, a song called "The Soldier," mm-hmm. and I'm happy with I'm happy with all the guitar tones, but. Usually there's like one that you just have that lucky day when the air between the mic and the amp is just perfect and all the stars are aligning and it's just a really wonderful tone. So um, that would be the type of thing that I would, you know, pull up and send to somebody at a company and say, this is the type of tone that is ideal. Mm. Um, But luckily that tone was done with my EMG signature pickup. Um, so I'd already developed it. So the way, it, the way it worked was, um, they sent me a bunch of pickups and, uh, I immediately realized that EMG is famous for their, uh, what's the one with the, the batteries? It's active. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Active. The, the batteries and they have that really, uh, signature sound, which is great for metal and great for rhythms, but it's not the most forgiving human type of sound. It's not, it doesn't have, it doesn't breathe like something very organic and human. And sometimes that's not what you want, Mm. but uh, I really wanted that organic human singing sound, the sound where, um, since I pick so unorthodox, um, sometimes I use the flesh of my finger. I use different fingers. I use it stronger, lighter, I pick hard, I pick soft, I pick very, very hard sometimes, and I want the pickup to not compress those things so they all sound the same. You know what I'm saying? I want mm. each little nuance to be picked up by the pickup, and the EMG uh, battery pickups are not famous for that. So they made me some that uh, were non-batteries, and uh, I just uh, went through them till I got really close, and I said, "This is this is great," and um, and I want to go a little bit more in this direction, and just simple simple things like that. But they probably had to do a lot of guesswork. But since I've known them for years, and they know what a mor- what a moron I am when it comes <laughs> to <laughs> talking um, tech talk, you know, they 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 probably can read the shorthand, and. Um, they got it done so perfectly and the pickup is just, it's a winner. I'm just so happy with it. I would love to take the credit for being some kind of a technical whiz about making, but it's completely all EMG. I mean, they, they were the guys who uh, masterminded it and it, it just, it sings in any guitar you put it in. It's just a killer. Yeah. Cool. I've got to try some. Um, you mentioned the, the kind of expressiveness of the pickup and that was something that really I mean everything about your album scenes really impressed me <laughs> but the the sheer nakedness of the guitar tones it was so you know there was nothing in the way between your fingers and the string and <laughs> you know the sound that came out you know um, right can you tell me what your thoughts are on that album this you know however many years later because that was a again that was a big one for me well, thank you very much. I, I, actually, the album uh, gets mentioned quite a lot, and uh, I'm mm. really pleased with that. And at the time, I really uh, was very happy with it. Um, and um, what you said about nothing getting in the way of guitar, you want to hear everything. That is something, not only on the Scenes album, but on every single time I play any guitar, I want it to be that way. Mm. On, scene, on scenes, it's almost all clean guitar, so it's uh, a little bit more reasonable to do that. But on the majority of my albums, I'm stacking a lot of different rhythms and counterpoints and solos. and But still, I want to hear all of those nuances. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, a bratty little kid who wants everything, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, it's that's really the case. Uh, on scenes, it's... Uh, 
very clean, and I just got very lucky to get that particular tone. That it, I had no plans, you know, no grand design to get any kind of special tone, but you know, a lot of lucky things happened in the studio. I got. I wound up getting a guitar from for Fernandez actually at the time, and I just plugged it in, and it sounded like that. I said, "Don't touch anything. Let's just record the whole album now." Mm. And uh, you know, it was it was just a lucky lucky break and um, a lucky tone, and uh, a lot of luck involved with everything, really. <laughs> yeah. See, when I think about my ideal guitar tone. It all goes back to I want like a distorted version of what I hear when I'm playing unplugged on the couch, you know, <laughs> that kind of dynamic uh-huh. range, you know, that would be perfect. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, geez, what else can we talk about? There's so many things I've wanted to ask you over the years and stuff. Um, let's see. Is there, I don't know, is there anything you never get asked that you really want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, I can definitely tell you about uh, my feelings about Australia, since that's uh, really a big thing, you know, because I've pretty much toured everywhere, luckily. And uh, I'm going to India for the first time this week, oh, so that's gosh. another one check off the checklist. But uh, oh, man, I'd love to I've been that. everywhere, toured with my solo band everywhere, toured in various various situations. And Australia, doing my first solo tour is a big deal mm. for me, uh, and it's a really a big deal for my band as well, because growing up in Japan, you know, most musicians, especially rock musicians, never leave the country. I mean, it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a really special thing where you can go out of the country and play your music, you know, and mm. so my band is is going to be coming to Australia for the first time, and and I get to squire them around, and uh, you know, and the shows are going to be great, and uh, so they're so excited about it, and and um, no one knows what to expect, and I sort of kind of know what to expect, but I don't really because I've never played there with the with this band, and uh, it's a very energetic. Uh, a very high energy gig, you know what I mean? Mm. It's, it's not. It's not just standing there playing instrumental music and expecting people to care about the technical details about it. You know, we're gonna mm. sweat a lot, and everybody's gonna leave drenched in sweat, <laughs> and uh, hopefully feeling really good. And uh, um, it's just one of those things that uh, my band is exci- as excited as I am, and. Uh, and I'm um, just very thankful and really planning to do more. I mean, this is kind of a first foot in the water in Australia for me. And, you know, things will go well this time and then we'll come back and do it again and play some more out of the way cities, hopefully, and maybe mm. some bigger shows. And you got to, you got to, you know, what do you, well, I'm thinking in Japanese now, what's the word? Uh, uh, um, you got to uh, cultivate. There you go. Mm. <laughs> got to cultivate, you know. So we go there and uh, make some more friends in Australia, and then hopefully they'll have us back sometime. Yeah. And, I mean, the two Melbourne shows, Melbourne is such a live music city that, you know, those are going to be huge. Like, those are going to go off. Um, we were recently, um, there was a survey of, like, cities, uh, population versus music venues and Melbourne was found to be like the life music capital of the world so we, we really? love it here we still love it here we still love to go out and see bands <laughs> that's great that's yeah. great no it's awesome like I walk down the street I live on and there are like four different you know bars that have music coming out of them like almost every night of the week and that's just one street <laughs> so in the middle of nowhere so yeah well, I did notice when I was in Australia that people really seem to have uh, care about music in general. At least the people that I met mm. seemed to like, you know, um, music wasn't just a uh, pastime. It wasn't just kind of there or taken for granted. They really seemed to be like hardcore fans and really um, into the minutia of music and, and caring about musical things where some places are less 
less, you know what I mean? Some people are mm. really, some places you go, people are really into music. Some people are just, well, it's the, you know, background music of life or whatever. But uh, in Australia, I just noticed, like, everybody kind of had a fever for music and people were hungry for information about you know, music and and just seemed like a very musical place. So uh, yeah. I was uh, very impressed by that. Maybe it's just the circles I travel in, but it feels like a lot of Aussies I know are still very much album people instead of, you know, find the single on Spotify or whatever. <laughs> uh, well, that's a good thing too. Yeah. Hey, I understand you're a uh, a bit of a record collector. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I do uh, collect uh, Elvis records on vinyl. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I've been collecting since I was like eight, and uh, I have oh. literally thousands. Um, oh, and actually, so cool. Australia I, I, Australia um, has some great ones, rare ones, that I would love to get my hands on if I have time to do that down there. Um, yeah. I'm going to be doing shows as well as master classes, so I'm going to be pretty busy down there but i'm going to try to slip off to some like rare record shops if i have a moment i remember last time i was there um last time in australia that's that's what i did i went to some very cool old school record store and bought a whole bunch of stuff and brought it back and because australia has different covers than the rest of the world and for a collector Mm. that's a um that's a plus and they, they keep records in relatively good condition for a long time. Um, not not as good as, say, Japan, which Japan is like, it's freakish how they keep records in good condition for, like, decades and decades. But, like, if you, you go to, like, a lot of uh, countries in uh, Latin America or in Europe um, and America, their records are beat up after about 10 years, so... Mm. I, was, I was I was happy that the, a lot of the Australian pressings were in in good shape, so I bought a ton of them and brought them back home. Yeah, there's a uh, there's an American style diner. We don't have many of those in Australia, but there's one on Chapel Street in Melbourne, which th- there's an entire wall that's just Elvis records, you know, used as decoration and put up there. And the owner is this dude Les, who is totally like obsessed with Elvis, and so like the whole. The whole place is like a tribute to Elvis. I'm sure that if you were to go Good in man. there, he, he would have some you know some uh, tips for you on whether he'll have some leads on how to find some good Elvis records in Australia. <laughs> ah, good man, good man. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, that looks like our time up. So thanks so much for the chat, and I can't wait to catch you in Melbourne. It's going to be amazing. My pleasure chatting with you, Peter. Hopefully, see you down there. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. All right. Take care. You too. See ya. Bye-bye.